Good afternoon. This is uh, another presentation by one of our RIPE members. Uh, this is Al uh, Penny, VO1NO, originally out of Newfoundland, transplanted through various other locations across Canada and the United States. But Al is an ex-president of the Halifax Amateur Radio Club, as well as many others in Ottawa and again stateside, yeah. most notably in uh, Colorado, Springs. Colorado Springs, NORAD. Um, some of the highlights, and I've, he, he's given me three pages of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of good stuff, right? So now I've got to try to highlight the best. Oh, that's enough. <laughs> Just mention the course. Well, Al is, of course, uh, <laughs> Al uh, teaches the uh, RAC course, and what Al does and the students he passes on to me as an examiner, I get to qualify more or less his work as an instructor, <laughs> he's done an excellent, excellent job of providing the candidates uh, to write the exam. Most notably, he's made four attempts to uh, cross the Atlantic on two meter VHF. Uh, fortunately, he tells me here that he's been unsuccessful and I don't think there's been anybody recently. Oh, it hasn't happened yet. No. Has happened yet. And you were running extreme power with extreme antennas yep. and still. Yeah, and still unsuccessful. Um, teaching. Al's probably most important job as far as amateur radio is concerned is the band plans and our position in the world relative to the, to the band plan. And he's been the band plan coordinator since 2013. And has spearheaded efforts uh, for the Canadian HF band plans and has their, and have them published in a graphic format. And he's currently coordinating and updating the VHF, UHF band plans. And the last uh, paragraph here tells me in 2017, he was asked to chair the International America Amateur Radio Union, IARU, Region 2 Band Plan Committee, and is responsible for all the aspects of band plan, band planning in Region 2, which is North and South America and the Caribbean. He's also a member of the IARU working group, restructuring HF digital modes and VHF plus and the VHF plus committee, which works at the international level to protect amateur band plants, 144 and above. So I give you Al Penny and he's got a very interesting presentation. I think so. I know you do, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm supposed to make a joke, but I'm, I'm not very accustomed to speaking in front of a group. And I don't have time, uh, you know, there's a lot to go cover here, but I will warn you, pay attention because there's a test at the end. Okay, you're looking at uh, a, a picture of something up there, defeating Hitler's Chase Me Charlies. Well, nowadays we're accustomed to seeing guided missiles strike targets. You know, you turn on YouTube, you go to Reddit, and you can see everything from manned portable uh, javelin missiles blowing the tops off tanks. Next slide, please. Or you can see the uh, uh, Russian uh, flagship Moskva uh, hit by two uh, uh, Neptune anti-ship missiles and uh, wasn't able to stop them. Two missiles, two hits, and it's gone. Wasn't always like that, however. World War II, aircraft could try bombing from high level. Uh, 15, 20,000 feet would take 40 seconds or more for the bomb stacks to get down there. And of course, in that time, the ship had a lot of a lot of time to maneuver and it's a funny thing about commanding officers of ships they're not real big fans of being hit by bombs and you can see right here that's a Japanese aircraft carrier in the Battle of Midway uh, June 1942 um, B-17s from the US Army Air Force have dropped uh, three strings of bombs there and of course they all missed none of the B-17s that dropped bombs that day actually hit anything it was the US Navy that went in at low level and uh, uh, sunk the, uh, the Japanese aircraft carriers. But unfortunately for the Navy, the Army Air Force had better PR people. They got the photos out to the newspapers and for months afterwards, everyone thought it was the Air Force that won the battle. Must have pissed off the Navy. Next slide. Anyway, if you really wanted to get in, you could uh, try coming in at a low level with dive bombers or torpedo bombers. Uh, but, you know, by the middle of the war, the Allies had, uh, had figured out that you needed to put anti-aircraft guns everywhere you could. 
And uh, you can see 20 millimeter uh, cannon there, Eulerkens, uh, 40 millimeter Bofors. Um, they literally made hundreds of thousands of those guns and stuck them on every available um, piece of uh, deck on, on warships. And as you can see, they would throw up quite a withering barrage. And uh, you didn't really have a whole lot of chance of getting in there. Uh, people say, but aircraft sank lots of ships. Well, think about Pearl Harbor. They attacked ships that were mobile or uh, immobile, stationary. And uh, yeah, they, they got very good at it by the end of the war. But still, it wasn't easy to sink a ship. It, uh, we needed a breakthrough to make it easy for, uh, for aircraft to sink ships out at sea. Next slide. So late August 1943, the first escort group um, is composed of the sloop uh, HMS Egret under Captain Brewer and uh, the frigates HMS Jed and HMS Rother. And they're oper operating off Cape uh, Finisterre in uh, northern Spain. And their job is to intercept German U-boats that are trying to break out into the Atlantic. Now before that, the uh, German U-boats, submarines, had tried to uh, go through the Bay of Biscay and escape out to the Atlantic that way, but Allied maritime patrol aircraft made that pretty uh, expensive for them. So they started creeping along the coast and trying to get out um, off of Spain instead. So the first escort group was sent out to, uh, to stop them. Next slide, that's Cape Finisterre. I look at that photo and I think, what a great location for antennas. And if you're a real ham out there, you know you thought it too. Next slide. So here's HMS Jed and HMS Rother, river class frigates. Uh, uh, ships of that class served in the Royal Canadian Navy during the war. HMS Egret was what was called a sloop. It was bigger than a corvette, had much longer range, and more weapons. So it was a really good uh, ASW uh, uh, ship. Their maximum speeds are about 22, 23 knots. Next slide. HMCS Athabascan and uh, HMS Grenville, uh, two destroyers, were assigned to cover this force. And uh, uh, of course, Athabascan was a uh, uh, tribal class, uh, heavily armed, uh, six 4.7 inch guns, two 4 inch AA guns, uh, torpedoes. HMS uh, Grenville had four 4.7 inch guns, torpedoes, and of course, light anti aircraft guns. And their job was to protect it in case German destroyers or aircraft came out. Now, the head of the escort group had been briefed that the Germans um, had some sort of new guided bomb weapon. Um, rocket propelled from what, uh, what Allied intelligence knew. And in fact, there'd even been a few unsuccessful attacks in the preceding few weeks. Um, but these things had missed, fortunately. Now, because of the, uh, the, the threat of these German-guided bombs, there was actually a special detachment of Boffins. Boffins are defense scientists, and uh, they were embarked in uh, Egret. And they were part of what's called the Y service. And their job was to listen uh, for any communications uh, between the, any German bombers that came out or any uh, guidance signals from uh, the guided bombs. There was also a detachment of photographers in HMS Grenville. It, uh, their job was to film any attack that uh, may have developed. Um, by the way, this is a, uh, um, an operator using one of the code-breaking machines that was developed by the British at Fletchley Park. That's the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. And it was a, I guess you could call it a, a very early electromechanical computer. Next slide. Now you're going to learn where the name for my presentation came from. On the 25th of August, 1943, there was a, a detachment of other uh, British ships in the area, and they had been attacked by several German bombers. And although none of the ships were hit, they did notice that the bombs seemed to follow uh, the, um, the, the destroyers or the ships as they maneuvered around. Um, and one of the chief yeoman of signals Looked, uh, looked at them and he called them Chase Me Charlies. And the name stuck in the Royal Navy. Next. So about 7.50 7 in the morning on the 27th of August, um, a Falk Wolf 200 uh, Condor, it was a maritime reconnaissance aircraft, uh, was spotted around the, uh, the British force, British Canadian force. And it was down around 8,000 feet, which was kind of unusual because they usually were much higher than that. 
Um, but of course, uh, it didn't take long for them to radio word back uh, of the position of the, uh, the Allied uh, ships. And uh, later on, about noon or so, um, the commander-in-chief in Plymouth, uh, or commander in the area in Plymouth, uh, sent a message to the force saying that you've been re reported by German reconnaissance aircraft. Now, the Condors weren't the only things that were keeping track of the Allied ships. At uh, 10.45, Grenville signaled Captain Brewer in the Agrit and reported Spanish trawler Perez Campos broadcast in Spanish for 20 minutes on 54, 55 kilocycles per second. What about sinking him? Of course, Spain wasn't part of the, uh, uh, you know, the Axis powers, but it was fascist and did cooperate with Germany during the Second World War. And Brewer said, well done, we'll sink him on the way back. Next slide. So 12.54, large uh, uh, group of aircraft were, um, were spotted uh, by radar at about 25 miles. And uh, they made ready for action. The, Brit the, the Allied ships made ready for action. And um, shortly, they spotted about 20 Dornier DO-217 uh, German medium bombers. Now, Athabasca had opened up fire first. Uh, five uh, German bombers uh, flew parallel to it. And uh, one by one, uh, these missiles seemed to drop off the wings of the uh, German bombers and uh, headed in towards Athabasca. Next. This is a picture of the German guided bomb um, coming towards uh, Grenville. Photo taken by the uh, special photo detachment that was uh, assigned. And despite the, uh, the heavy fire and uh, the ships maneuvering, um, it was pretty apparent that the gu uh, bombs were guided. And uh, Commander Roger Hill in the um, um, Grenville reported, it seemed the controller could control the direction of the bomb, but not the loss of height. Hill, by the way, had uh, an outstanding war record. If I've got time at the end, I'll tell you a few stories about him. Next. So Athabaskan put up a pretty, uh, a pretty fierce barrage, a lot of guns in Athaby. Um, but the German we uh, new German weapon managed to get through. One of them uh, struck the destroyer with shattering impact, class passed clean through the hull below the bridge, and exploded six feet clear of the side. And that damaged the boiler room in Athabascan, and it uh, coasted to a, a stop without, uh, without any steam to drive the engines. Uh, two more bombs came in, but fortunately they missed, and it's quite possibly because there was such a cloud of uh, smoke and steam uh, surrounding uh, uh, the Athabascan, uh, that the German um, uh, uh, bomb aimers, I guess I'll call them, uh, couldn't actually see the ship. Anyway, Bathaby had been uh, seriously hurt. Five men were killed, uh, 12 were injured, a large fire raged, uh, the forward guns had been knocked out, the radars had been knocked out, the fire control system had been knocked out, but the after guns kept firing. Next. This is a picture from the German aircraft of the bomb hitting uh, Athabascan. One thing you should, or we should note about it is that Athabascan deliberately limited its uh, uh, speed during the uh, attack to 23 knots. Um, that was to keep up with or, or not to outdistance uh, the other slower ships in the uh, formation. Now, um, the uh, Grenville, um, the, the captain in Grenville decided he was going to use higher speed. He went up to about 35 knots and uh, he was able to at the last moment as the bombs were coming in, make a, a sharp uh, turn, and uh, when the bombs tried to follow, uh, they turned too sharply, stall, and fall into the ocean. And it was realized that uh, that was a great thing to do if you had the speed and, and maneuverability, and that information was definitely passed on to the, uh, the Allied fleets. Next picture. Egret wasn't so lucky. Uh, about two minutes after uh, Athabaskan was hit, Egret suddenly exploded uh, like that. Next. Capsized. Uh, for a short while, the uh, fore part was above the water. You could see the Asdik dome. That's that little black thing sticking up. Uh, Asdik, was, it was called at the time, but we now know it as sonar. Um, I should tell you about one survival tale from the Egret. Um, the doctor... Uh, had been outside his sick bay when the, um, uh, uh, the bomb hit. When he came to after being knocked unconscious, he realized the ship had capsized. He was in the pitch black, 
but he also knew that uh, the only way to get out was to dive down and out in a ship that was rapidly sinking and, and uh, flooding. Um, he managed to get out. He was picked up by a boat from Grenville, and uh, once he got on board uh, Grenville, he was put to work immediately um, treating the wounded. I should mention of the crew of 231, only 37 survived. Now, uh, this isn't the Athabascan, but it's the type of guns that would have been firing um, in the after part of uh, Athaby. And after the action, Grenville signaled Athabascan and said, your gun flashes throwing, showing through the smoke and fire, which was all we could see of you, was a proud sight. And Athaby limped back to uh, Plymouth and got back there several days later and uh, had to be uh, uh, repaired. Now, the first escort group, what remained of it, uh, stayed on station, defiantly on station, and that defiance was uh, uh, rewarded several days later when they killed a the U-boat. That's a picture of uh, Athaby arriving in uh, 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 Plymouth. Now, one thing that the uh, Allied Command did do, however, uh, in recognition of the fact that this new weapon didn't have any countermeasures to it and it posed a very serious threat to uh, Allied warships, was they pulled the escort ships 215 nautical miles further back from the coast of Spain and Portugal. That allowed a much wider corridor for the uh, German submarines to escape through and um, it, it made it much easier for them to escape out into the Atlantic. So with one attack, uh, the German High Command had achieved a, a major uh, victory. I mentioned the Y service. The Y service uh, was wireless intercept. The WI is where they got Y. It was a network of receiving stations uh, throughout the UK, in fact, throughout the world eventually. It uh, was founded in, uh, during the First World War and then reformed again in the Second World War. And uh, what was it here? They had, uh, oh, 600 receiving sets in use at Y stations. A lot of hams became um, operators at the Y service, either uh, in the military directly or even as volunteer interceptors. Uh, you know, hams that weren't, in, weren't uh, able to join the military, they could still listen and uh, send the reports to Bletchley Park. Uh, the picture at the top there is uh, the uh, recreation of a Y service uh, receiving station. That's, uh, you can see that at uh, Bletchley Park. And the other photo in the inset there is the uh, radio room in uh, HM HMCS Algonquin, just to show you what it would have been like uh, for radio op operators out at sea. Now, I mentioned that the, uh, the EGRIT had uh, the team of uh, Boffins, uh, defense scientists on board. Uh, they'd been listening for German um, transmissions. They did intercept voice transmissions from the bombers, but there were no guidance signals detected. Next slide. Well, 25th of July, 1943, um, uh, Mussolini was overthrown, and that put an end to 21 years of fascist rule in uh, Italy. And the new Italian government uh, decided it really didn't want to be fighting in a war, and they entered into secret negotiations with the Allies. On the 8th of September, General Eisenhower announced that an armistice had been reached with uh, Italy. And uh, one of the conditions of the armistice was that the Italian fleet, which was quite a nice uh, a fleet of uh, battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, it was to sail and uh, be interned uh, at the British island of Malta. Um, so the uh, main naval base at La Spezia, um, the fleet got ready and sailed. Now the German high command was expecting this, and they had a bunch of uh, aircraft units standing by. And they had orders, um, if it sails south, uh, if it sails north, protect it. If it sails south, sink it. One uh, should point out that uh, when Italy was invaded, the, the mainland of Italy, it was Canadians that actually landed uh, first and uh, achieved, uh, got their, their troops ashore with, uh, with very little resistance uh, before the Brits and the Americans. Just a little bit of, tid, you know, you can tell that at, uh, next time you're in a bar for trivia. Anyway, um, could you go back to the picture of the map? Yeah, there we are. Yeah. So they sailed from La Spezia, and that was the intended route. They were going to sail between uh, Corsica and uh, Sar um, Sardinia and uh, down to Malta. But when they were um, in the, uh, what's it, the Straits of Bonifacio, 
Um, they were attacked by German aircraft coming in at 16,000 feet. Next picture. That's the battleship Roma. Uh, there were uh, three of that class, beautiful ships, um, nine 15-inch guns. They were basically the, the, the equivalent of um, uh, Tirpitz or Bismarck. So it would have been nice to, uh, to not have those end up in uh, German hands. And if you're a German, you didn't want them ending up in Allied hands. Uh, force was commanded, or uh, three of those battleships, uh, I think it was th uh, three cruisers and uh, eight destroyers were part of the uh, uh, Italian fleet that was sailing south. And force was commanded by Admiral Bergamini in the Roma. So the German aircraft came in. And at the time, the Italians weren't sure if they were German or Allied because they'd been promised air, uh, protection by Allied aircraft. When they realized it was uh, German aircraft, the Germans had dropped bombs, but they seemed to drop them well short. And uh, at w w when they saw them coming, they thought, oh, this is just uh, to scare us. The bombs were dropped too far away. Um, anyway, uh, bombs soon started... Instead of falling straight down, they started coming in at a bit of an angle, and it was realized that they were indeed uh, targeted. Um, the bombs resembled, uh, well, they, they didn't resemble small aircraft like the uh, first escort group had uh, experienced. In fact, they uh, looked like they were big, heavy bombs with little stubby X wings and this uh, cruciform um, uh, tail. Anyway, they were dropped from uh, 16,000 feet, and their altitude, or their uh, accuracy was pretty uncanny. Of the 11 bombs dropped, three hit. That is, that's unheard of for uh, uh, bombs, you know, bombing from that altitude, trying to hit maneuvering warships. And of course, these are German uh, photos taken during the attack. Uh, the bombs have been highlighted in uh, white. So Italia was hit uh, first. It suffered uh, 500 tons of uh, flooding um, damage, uh, but managed to survive. Roma got hit uh, twice. Um, next picture, please. This is after the second hit. You notice that the second turret, B turret, is totally gone. It, um, it was uh, blasted off. Um, from the Italian Navy website, at 1545, the Roma was hit on the right side. The bomb burst into sea after having crossed the whole hull, and the ship's speed was reduced to 10 knots. At 1550, the Roma was struck again by a second bomb. This one exploded in the forward deposits of the big caliber complexes. This is the translation from the, uh, that is actually on the Italian Navy website. The ship was fatally wounded. A col column of flames and smoke rose for a thousand meters. The turret number two, along with all of its occupants and the command tower, were projected aloft and tilted to the right side. This, uh, it was the end for Bergamini and his staff. The ship began to tilt to the right side. It was a horrendous show of death and destruction. The majority of the men were burned alive. Not a pleasant ship to be in. Next one. You can see where the hits were. That second hit was the one that killed the ship. It uh, managed to uh, uh, cause the 15-inch uh, gun magazine to explode. And that's the result. Um, 622 men managed to escape in the next nine minutes. But, next picture, there we are. Uh, no, yeah, that one right there. At 1612, the Roma capsized, broke in two, and sank. And uh, two admirals, 86 officers, and 1,264 sailors uh, were lost. So quite a serious loss of life there. And of course, I mentioned uh, three of 11 bombs hit. So that was, that was a serious uh, threat now to the Allied fleet. And uh, when you can sink a battleship with two bomb hits like that from 16,000 feet, you start looking for countermeasures. Next one. There's more to come, though. A few days later, or correction, later that day, um, the cruiser uh, USS Savannah was uh, hit. That's a picture that was taken as the, uh, the bomb passed through number three a gun turret. It had three turrets up forward. The bomb passed through and exploded, uh, blew a hole uh, 24 by 30 feet in the side of the uh, hull. There happens to be a PT boat passing in front of the, of the uh, cruiser, just a fluke at the time. Next photo. 
That's the picture where it went into the, um, uh, in through the turret. Now, this ship was really lucky that the bomb blew a hole in the hull because the inrush of water actually stopped a magazine explosion. Otherwise, it would have been blown to bits like the um, aroma. Uh, how many... Uh, 197 men and officers died in that attack. This is a picture of the British warship uh, War Spite, very distinguished uh, war record, First World War and the Second World War. It got struck by three bombs. Now, fortunately, it did a lot of damage, but fortunately, uh, not a lot of li a loss of life. I think it was nine dead and 14 wounded, uh, but the ship was seriously damaged and had to be towed back to Malta, and they managed to get it repaired enough to, uh, to strike back at the Germans at the invasion of Normandy, where it served for uh, gunfire support. And don't worry, I'm getting some electronics here in a moment. <laughs> Next one. Uh, HMS Uganda, which later became HMCS Quebec, that was hit. HMS Spartan, another cruiser at the bottom there, it was hit and sunk. This is a sad one. Uh, His Majesty's Hospital Ship Newfoundland, I thought there might be a few people here that would appreciate that name. Um, it was uh, struck by a German guide bomb off of the Italian coast, even though it was uh, properly lit up um, with Red Cross markings. Fortunately, there were only two patients on board. Both survived. They tried to save the ship, but uh, eventually it got uh, so bad that the ship, the, the fire got so bad the ship had to be scuttled. Uh, six nurses and six doctors were killed. And in addition to those ships, a lot of other ships were, uh, were sunk or damaged, and it was becoming quite evident to the, uh, uh, the Allies that something had to be done to counter these bombs. Next. Now, they could fly off um, aircraft, uh, such as this Sea Fire, and they could start shooting down the German bombers and protect the fleet. Next. They could even lay uh, smoke screens, make it hard for the Germans to aim the bombs at the Allied ships. Those will all help. Uh, you can go back. Those all help, but we had to find an electronic method of countering those bombs. Now, the first hint of the German bombs came in the Oslo report. The Oslo report was uh, two letters that were dropped off at the British Embassy in Oslo in November 1939. Uh, of course, the Brits were at war with Germany, but Norway uh, still hadn't been invaded. It turned out, we didn't realize at the time, but the letters were written by a German physicist uh, who was very well placed, and he knew what uh, was going on in uh, German research and development. And the Oslo report, these two letters, had information about German radar, German weapons, all sorts of uh, things. Now, when the British got it, um, British intelligence first said, this can't be true, this is too good to be true, this has to be an attempt to deceive us. But as the war went on, more and more of the things that uh, were talked about in the uh, Oslo report came true, including, of course, the guided bombs. In fact, uh, there was one British uh, uh, scientist um, R.B. Jones, um, some of you I could see nodding your head, you know that name. He said, uh, you know, as the war went on, we'd solve one crisis and then we'd wait, or, or then we'd read the Oslo letters to see, uh, to see what the Germans were going to throw at us next. And Allied uh, code breakers were starting to get a lot more information about the operational deployments of the bombs. What units had them, how many bombs they had, things like that. And the code breakers, of course, uh, were at Bletchley Park. And that upper photo is a Colossus. It's, uh, again, an early uh, electromechanical computer that was used to decode the German uh, messages. Those messages didn't have a lot of technical details that the Allies needed to come up with countermeasures. Next. Anyone recognize the, uh, the picture of that place there with the barrage balloon in front of it? It is indeed the Tower of London. The Tower of London was used as a POW, um, I won't say a camp, but I guess a place for, for keeping some POWs in the First World War and again in the Second World War. And uh, by the fall of uh, 1943, some of the crew members of the bombers uh, that had attacked the Allied ships with these guided bombs were being kept at the Tower of London and they were being interrogated there. And no, they weren't being stretched on the rack. 
if you can see that picture. Anyway, the, uh, the POW uh, interrogations revealed a good bit of information. The British found out that the system, the guidance system, had 18 channels. So they could control 18 uh, bombs at once. The name of the in inventor was a certain Anton Kramer. I don't know if that really mattered. Um, and they found out, you know, some of the operational details about the bomb. Now, one POW said that the bomb operated on a wavelength of 16 meters, which is about 19 megahertz. Um, the British suspected 19.2 megahertz uh, because a, um, a cruiser, HMS Orion, in the uh, Mediterranean had intercepted signals on 19.2 megahertz. Now, several ships had also reported interference on their Type 279 radar. And the Type 279 radar operated down around 40.2 megahertz. But when that was suggested to the POWs, one of them said, well, it can't be that frequency because that's the frequency our own communication radios operate on and they, it would interfere to the, uh, with it. So based on the information that they had, the British first thought that the bombs operated between 19 and 20 megahertz. Now, I will point out that it doesn't appear that the uh, POW, POWs were trying to deceive the Allies. Uh, they simply didn't know. They knew how to use the system, but they had no idea what frequency it operated on. Next. In any event, the Allied uh, ELINT, Electronic Intelligence Gathering Teams, uh, went to work. Uh, Royal Navy, U.S. Navy, and the Mediterranean. Um, the uh, wasn't easy. They didn't know what part of the spectrum to start searching, so they had to start searching everything. Uh, the radio division, oh, and also, when a bomb attack takes place, it only takes a minute or so for those bombs to come in, and then the, the, the guidance signals stop. So you're, you're really, you've got to be fast to start uh, searching all the available spectrum to find out if you can uh, determine the operating frequencies. So the radio division of the U.S. Naval uh, uh, Research Lab modified S-27 and S-36 helicrafters receivers to cover the range from 27 to 220 megahertz. And they did things like uh, radio or correction motor driven uh, tuning capacitors, tuning condensers they were called back then. They reduced the sensitivity of the IF so that it was a bit broader so it would be easier to uh, detect signals, things like that. In about six weeks, they modified about 20 of these uh, receivers and had them sent to the Mediterranean. Anyone use those receivers? S yeah, still? <laughs> so the uh, British also met with some success. There was a Lieutenant John Field, the G2 section of the Telecommunication Research Establishment, and he was at the Allied beachhead at Anzio in Italy. And he'd, uh, he was listening, and in January 1944, he intercepted signals um, in the six-meter spectrum. And in 19, it, when he analyzed those signals, he was able to figure out that it was based on a variable mark space ratio two-tone modulation system. And with that information, he gathered up all the equipment he could in the, uh, in the area from the RAF workshops, and he built um, a bunch of spot jammers, 150 watt jammers that were designed to operate on the frequencies in that range. This guy must have been a ham. He was pretty ingenious. They fit the, fitted them in 12 warships in the Mediterranean fleet. Now, they weren't as successful as they'd hoped they would be because, as I said, it's pretty hard to, you don't have a whole lot of time to determine the frequency of the bombs as they're falling on you. And then you've got to tune your jamming transmitter to the right frequency. And remember, we didn't have digital displays back then. They were basically making a guess with the calibration of the receivers and the transmitters and trying to make them match. So it was a pretty difficult thing. So ships were getting sunk. Yep, back, uh, next one. So as a stopgap measure, they recommended that any officer who had a, um, an electric uh, razor during an attack should go up to the upper deck, turn on the razor, and hold it up like that. And the purpose, you know, electric razor like that, little uh, uh, relay going back and forth basically, makes a bit of a spark, and they figured that might help jam the bombs. Well, maybe it would, but it'd be pretty darn close. And I think the only benefit to that was the, uh, 
uh, the, the psychological effect that it had on the uh, on the sailors. Although I dare say that any anyone who knew how little impact that would have, it would have been a negative <laughs> psychological impact. Next slide. Now the U.S. Navy also produced some jammers, and uh, for a frequency range they thought they operated on, and they installed them in the um, destroyer escorts, the Frederick C. Davies and the Herbert C. Jones, which are seen right here. And uh, they were attacked um, on November 26 during a, uh, while well, they were escorting a convoy off Algiers. They turned on their jammers, and they reported a very heavy attack, and uh, they, they didn't have a whole lot of success jamming the bombs. This, by the way, is a picture of those two ships. I've gone over the picture, and as far as I can see, the jamming antennas, or the antennas for the jamming system, uh, are mounted on the after funnel. Uh, very hard to see there, but I can't see those antennas in any other ships of that class, so maybe that's it. Allied uh, aircraft soon showed up and managed to drive the German bombers uh, off, but not before the German bombers had struck. Next one. That was the troop transport, the Rona. It was a British transport that had U.S. troops on board. Um, hit by a glide bomb, um, the initial impact killed hundreds of uh, uh, troops and crew members. Um, they couldn't lower the lifeboats because the, the ship rapidly uh, took on a list. And uh, make a long story short, um, 1,015 American troops, three Red Cross personnel, and 120 crew members perished in that attack. That was the worst attack um, with, with the loss of life for U.S. Uh, Army troops in uh, history. Um, not many people know about that attack. Uh, people thought after the war that news had been suppressed. Turned out it hadn't been suppressed. It's just that so many things happened within a few months of that that uh, it, was, um, it was overlooked. Now, I should point out that the jammers that were in the, uh, the two American destroyer escorts, they wouldn't have had any impact. They operated between uh, 10 and 35 megahertz. And as we're going to see now, that wasn't the frequencies that the, uh, or the, the range that the German bombs operated on. They did manage to have one little bit of good luck, though. Uh, actually, you can go back. During the attack, a receiver, just a, a regular re or a communications receiver, had accidentally been left on one of the frequencies that was being used by the German bombs. And someone noticed they're hearing some signals on this frequency. They managed to turn on a recorder, and they got recordings of the signal. They now know what the, uh, now knew what the signal sounded like and uh, what frequency range it was in. Next picture. Allies also got another break. They found an intact bomb washed up on uh, shore at um, Anzio. This isn't the bomb. This is actually a German uh, man torpedo, but it was the best photo I could find. And if you don't know anything about World War II, it probably fool you. I'm just an honest guy. Anyway, it got salvaged by that uh, same Lieutenant Field, and he sent it back to uh, uh, the UK for examination. And the Allies got lucky again. Um, as they overran a, uh, an airfield that was used by the Luftwaffe, uh, next slide, please, they managed to recover both damaged bombers and damaged bombs. Now, some of these, next picture, that's the sort of stuff they had to work with, trying to, uh, you know, trying to figure out what this did. Uh, some of these had been damaged by the Germans before they left. Some of them were actually uh, damaged by Allied aircraft a few weeks earlier when the Y service had intercepted radio signals saying that uh, a bunch of German bombers were grounded at, at that airfield because of weather. So the Allies sent 90 P-38 Lightnings and eight uh, heavy bombers from the Royal Air Force to bomb them at uh, dawn, and they destroyed, I think it was 45 uh, German aircraft and damaged 17 others. And that takes, uh, you know, that, that helped certainly protect the, uh, the, uh, the Allied fleet off Anzio. Next picture. Can you imagine trying to sort through that and figure out what, uh, what this thing did? That's what they had to work with. Anyway, when they started putting it all together, next one, the difference in the two bombs and attack levels, or the difference in the two attack levels became clear. There were actually two German guided weapons. One was a heavy bomb that was dropped at high altitude. 
and that was the um, Kramer X1. And the other was a rocket um, boosted glide bomb that um, had stubby wings like uh, the one on the bottom there, HS293. Next. So this bomb was dubbed the Fritz X by the Germans and uh, it was an ordinary free fall bomb. It had uh, these stubby little wings there fitted uh, to it and the tail had the guidance system and um, you would also operate, uh, had servos that would operate spoilers that could help steer the bomb. It weighed 3,100 pounds or 1,400 kilos and could penetrate 130 millimeters or 5.1 inches of deck armor when uh, released, I'll put this in feet, at about 18 to 22,000 feet. So it could punch through heavy armor. That's what the attack profile looked like. Once the uh, bomb was dropped, the aircraft throttled back, climbed about 1,000 feet, and kept the bomb in view and guided it in. It had uh, rockets in the tail so that it was easier for the um, um, controller to see the bomb. Next one. And you can see those uh, flares there. Um, it was the Fritz X that uh, sank the uh, Roma, uh, that damaged the War Spite and the Savannah. Next one. It's carried underneath the wing or the fuselage, depending on the uh, aircraft. Now the other one was the Henschel HS-293. This was a glide bomb. This is what hit uh, Athabascan. Uh, the bomb uh, was, uh, what was it, 400 kilos of explosive, but it wasn't designed to penetrate armor. It was designed to take out things like merchant ships and, and lighter vessels. Um, it was controlled like a conventional aircraft. It had ailerons and uh, an elevator and a rudder. Um, the rocket is missing a cover there in that photo, but the rocket is under, slung underneath there. It provided 600 kilos, or 1,300 pounds of thrust uh, for about 10 seconds, and that boosted the speed up to uh, what speed? Oh, about 400, 500 kilometers an hour. Next. And that's what an attack looked like. It would fly parallel to the uh, target at about anywhere from two to 10 nautical miles at about um, 3,000, 4,000 feet and uh, let the bomb go, rocket um, um, increased the speed, they steered it in. It also had flares in the tail so that the uh, aimer could track it. And that's how he controlled it, a little joystick in the aircraft, just like that. That would take care of up, down, left, right. Next. They had to keep the propellant warm, so they actually vented a um, hot exhaust from the engines in through the, um, uh, the, the uh, rocket propellant, and they could actually tell what the temperature was um, on the, the equipment panel that uh, controlled the bomb. If it was too cold, of course, the, uh, uh, the rocket wouldn't work properly. Next. That's the Hinkle HE-177, the, the Griffin, or Grief in German. That was, uh, that's actually a four-engine bomber. Uh, there are two engines in each, in a cell on each uh, wing there. Uh, that was the type of uh, aircraft that was responsible for sinking uh, the Rona. The Germans, by the way, call that, sh call that aircraft the Luftwaffenführerzig, uh, the, uh, the Luftwaffe cigarette lighter, because the engines had this unfort unfortunate tendency to burst into flame. That's a simulator for, the, um, uh, for training the bomb aimers. Next. And this is a photo of a uh, develop, development model. It's being tested up, at, uh, up around Pinamunde, which is where they tested the V1s and the V2s. Um, now, I should mention that the guidance system used in both the Fritz X and in the uh, HS-293 were the same. Uh, it was called the Kiel Strasberg uh, guidance system. Kiel was the transmitter, Strasberg was the uh, receiver. Next. They actually managed to recover some intact uh, transmitters and receivers, and uh, they discovered uh, they operated on 18 channels between 48 and 50 megahertz based 
100 kilohertz apart. Uh, up, down, left, right were tones that were sent uh, on the, uh, the signal. Remember, field only reported two tones. There were actually uh, four. You just can't hear them of the human ear sometimes. Next. That's the antenna, a dipole fitted on the uh, aft of the uh, aircraft like that. Next. So the Americans uh, came up with the uh, next generation jammer, the uh, XCJ. And that was a spot jammer. It was able to operate in the right frequency range. Uh, but it wasn't as successful as they'd hoped because once again you had to tune it manually and you had to tune the, the uh, uh, jammer. Next. That shows uh, the panoramic um, display that they had. At least they were able to monitor the entire two megahertz uh, uh, of the band. Next. That's the power supply, and that small box up top, that's a recorder. They could actually record voice and signals that they picked up. Next, that's the antenna. They had one mounted port and starboard. And the next one, that's actually the receive antenna. I put that up because I thought it was an interesting design. It had a low SWR over a range of 15 to 55 megahertz. Uh, won't go over it now, but you can look at it uh, later. Now, the Americans realized they needed an interim um, jammer um, until they were able to get enough of these uh, more specialized jammers. They modified a U.S. Army uh, transmitter. Uh, they fitted a panoramic uh, um, receiver to it, and that, they came up with the ARQ-8 spot jammer. But once again, it wasn't fast enough to respond to uh, the bombs as they came in. One good thing about it, though, was that the local oscillator of the receiver was tied into the transmitter, so it made it a bit easier to make sure they were on the same frequency. Now, the Americans eventually came up with the MAS, the uh, MAS, and this was their ultimate uh, jammer for this. It was a spot jammer, but it was much more automatic in operation, and it actually transmitted a, a tone that uh, would take control of the bomb and turn it to the right and crash it into the water. Uh, output was, I think, 500 watts for that one. And they built it in two weeks by going to uh, New York City and buying parts from, uh, you know, commercial radio stores. That right there, that's, a few years ago that was secret. Well, during the war that was secret. You, online you can get all sorts of information on how to use this top secret electronic warfare equipment from World War II. Isn't the internet great? Next one. Now, the Canadians weren't, uh, weren't left out. Uh, the radar branch of the National Research uh, Council of Canada was asked by the Navy to come up with a jammer uh, in February, late February 1944, and by uh, March, they'd produced a jammer. And it was known as the Canadian Naval Jammer. And it was a powerful thing. It could jam everything between 48 and 50 megahertz. Um, what was the output here? Uh, mo frequency modulated 150 hertz. Um, and the output was, doggone it, I don't see it here. Anyway, it was quite high, a uh, thousand watts or so. And it was fitted into several ships in time, uh, in time for D-Day. And during D-Day, one operator said, uh, Algonquin had one installed two weeks before D-Day. All you had to do was turn the set to the on position and it did its own work, jamming signals. It was very secretive. Our instructions were given at various times when to turn it on. On D-Day, it did destructive work to the Rodney, a British battleship. We were told to turn the damn thing off as it blocked signals to their, uh, their guttery radar. Next. Uh, the British came up with an interim system. A guy named D.D. Silverstone, 21-year-old scientist, was uh, told to come up with a, a spot jammer. And uh, he developed one, and again, it used a, a panoramic display. Um, and it was a great interim uh, solution, but again, like all these interim solutions, it, you didn't have time to react uh, during a concentrated attack. So he knew he had to come up with something better, and he came up with something very ingenious. Next. He came, if, if, just a quick review of the Superhet receiver. Uh, you've got a local oscillator, and of course you mix everything, uh, you mix the incoming signal and you get the uh, intermediate frequency. Uh, intermediate frequency gets amplified, modulated, and the, uh, the audio then goes, in our case, to a speaker, 
In case of the bomb, it went to four filters, one for each up, down, left, right uh, um, command, and the servos that were associated with it. Um, he knew that the IF of the German receiver was three megahertz. And if you could jam the IF, you could jam all the bombs, no matter what frequency they operated on. So how are you going to jam the IF of a, um, of a, a radio like that? Well, the solution was something that hams are pretty familiar with. He got his hands on uh, 200 uh, British Army wire, uh, number 36 uh, transmitters. They operated in the right frequency range. Next picture. He had two fitted to HMS Woodpecker. I know, it's a funny name. That ship was responsible for sinking six U-boats. It was sunk in February 1944, um, but uh, fortunately no loss of life. Acoustic torpedo hit the tail, so no one was killed. Anyway, those are the antennas that were fitted on the after end, uh, just after the funnel in HMS Woodpecker. Notice it's two dipoles, um, horizontal dipoles. Silverstone's solution was ingenious. He transmitted one signal on 47 megahertz, another one on 50 megahertz. Both of them, of course, were able to get uh, through the front end of the, uh, the receiver in the German-guided bombs, and they got mixed in the mixer. And one of the intermodulation distortion products is going to be 3 megahertz. 3 megahertz just happens to be the IF, the intermediate frequency, and that caused, basically, intermod in the, um, in the receiver. And that was the type 650 jammer. They came up with 100 of those and fitted uh, a bunch of ships in time for D-Day. First ones to be fitted were the ships that were going to control the uh, aircraft, the fighters off the Allied coast. Next photo. Then the British came up with the 651 version, which was the same principle, just 1,000 watt uh, uh, transmitters. And that really extended the range that uh, they could jam German bombs. That's a photo of uh, the fleet at D-Day. Um, so between the Type 650, 651, the Canadian Naval Jammer, and the American Maws, plus the other spot jammers that were still, were still uh, available, um, the Allies didn't suffer very much at the hands of uh, German-guided bombs. Um, from what we can tell, maybe one or two um, ships were actually sunk by German-guided bombs. Hard to tell exactly because the, uh, you know, the attacks were pretty busy times and some of the ships may have been sunk by mines. Um, but we, it was pretty evident that the jammers uh, did their job. Now, the bombs were used a few more times uh, before the end of the war. Uh, here they took out uh, some bridges to prevent the, Rush the Soviets uh, from crossing the Oder River in Poland. But basically, there wasn't much, uh, much more they could do against the, uh, the Western Allies. Uh, Germans had plans for uh, things like wire-guided versions and um, um, TV-guided versions. Even had a version that was going to be uh, launched into bomber aircraft. But, uh, of course, uh, like a lot of German ideas, it, was, uh, it just didn't have time to develop it. Next slide. Well, how good was the, uh, was the system? How much time have I got? Five minutes. Ah, oh, heck, I can do this. Well... It was an amazing technical achievement, and it was revolutionary. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the Allies, it wasn't until, uh, you know, 44, 45, that uh, the Allies started thinking about doing similar sorts of things. Next slide. But it had some problems. There was an antenna mismatch. The antenna that they used on the, the German aircraft wasn't properly matched. The transmitter output was 45 watts. Only 30 watts actually got transmitted. Analysis we've done nowadays indicates that 30 watts was barely enough to control those bombs at extreme range. Oh, whoops, so back. Also, one thing that hams again are familiar with, multipath propagation. Um, they tested the bombs over land, but when you get over the sea, of course, salt water is a great reflector. And uh, it wasn't realized at the time, but recent analysis has shown that a lot of the German bombs probably suffered from, uh, it, it, basically, they were interfering with themselves, multipath propagation. Next slide. They actually did some studies, and they, you could figure out uh, what altitudes and ranges uh, you'd suffer from multipath. There was also a chance that Doppler um, caused a problem, but I think it was mostly multipath. Next. 
Um, one thing I should mention is that one third of the bombs consistently did not work. They basically failed, and no one realized why at the time. I mean, even the, the German attacks against the, the Allied ships in uh, 1943, before we had any jammers, a lot of the bombs just fell in the water. It was probably multipath. Now, a good operator could cr um, compensate for that by making sure he didn't have to make any corrections uh, for the final uh, stages of the attack. But of course, those operators were shot down and uh, lost, and more and more inexperienced operators were, uh, you know, filled their their their, uh, their place. And those uh, operators didn't have the skill to guide the bombs for the final phase. Affect the ship speed. Notice that nothing that was able to go 24 knots or higher was able to be uh, hit by uh, a German bomb. Speed is your friend. Next. So. All in all, let me take a look here, what I was going to say. The Strasbourg system, the, the Kiel uh, Strasbourg, Strasbourg system was pretty good, but it had a lot of uh, problems that made it much easier for the Allies to jam it. Okay? So, uh, we, we lucked in, in in that sense. But I should mention the bravery and the, uh, and the tenacity uh, of the, the crews that uh, fought through this and also, of course, the, uh, the skill and dedication of the scientists and uh, engineers and technicians who built the jamming system. Next. Did the jamming work? Yeah, the bombs initially worked quite well, but then the percentage of bomb hits uh, dropped off. Now, allies increasingly control the air, a lot of losses uh, on the Germans, both in aircraft and in air crew, but the jamming definitely played a part. And you can see, once we introduce those new jammers, the percentage of bomb hits went way down. Next. And over there, that tall blue line, during uh, uh, the month of June 1944, D-Day, the Germans uh, used about 180 bombs. That shows you that only that the red line there, only a handful actually hit. Next. So, 23 Allied ships uh, sunk, 9 heavily damaged, 12 others damaged, 3,531 lives lost. So, a lot of success in 1943, early 1944. But then both the HS-293 and the Fritz X um, didn't achieve a whole lot uh, later in the war. So, all in all, yep, the, uh, the Allied jamming effort worked in conjunction with a bunch of other uh, factors. But I guess we, one thing to, to remember is, yeah, it worked. We would have won the war anyway, but the jamming certainly uh, saved a lot of lives and a lot of, um, a lot of shipping and, and uh, material. There we go. Any questions? Yes. They, they tried to come up with uh, different versions, the, the, the TV-guided one, the wire-guided version. But like a lot of things that Germany was trying to work on in 1944-45, it was just too little too late. Yeah, they had a lot of good ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and of course, uh, you know, a lot of the scientists were captured and went to work for NASA and went to work for the, uh, the Soviet uh, space program. Fortunately, our Russian scientists were better than their Russian scientists, or, or our German scientists were better than the Russian German scientists. That was a joke. <laughs> Any others? Okay, there we go. And contacted me when I was still in the military, and I was able to send him some information from the library at National Events Headquarters, some